Red Brick Media. Oh. High quality CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences, and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our Dawah work, supported by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk. <laughs> الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم امن الرسول بما انزل اليه اليه من ربهم والمؤمنون كل امن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين احد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا واطعنا غفرانك ربنا واليك المصير indeed we praise you to allah we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask allah to guide us to beneficial knowledge and righteous actions Brothers, you know this subject of Isa alayhi salam, you know, subhanAllah, this is really for us a very phenomenal subject. Because really, and if you consider this, that Isa alayhi salam, the Quran, it talks more about Isa alayhi salam by name. He's mentioned 25 times in the Quran than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And as we know, obviously, the Quran is referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam frequently. But in terms of name, the Quran, it refers more to Isa alayhi salam. Okay, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In fact, Surah Al-Baqarah, you could say, and Surah Al-Ali Imran are extensively focused on, okay, Isa alayhi salam and Bani Israel. Uh, you know, even to the extent, brothers, with Surah Al-Fatiha, we are obviously making a inference in relation to the Nasara and also you could say Isa alayhi salam. So as we know, when we, in Surah Al-Fatiha, we ask Allah Ta'ala, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us along the straight path. What is this straight path? As we know, this is the path of the Anbiya. Okay, you know, Allah subhanahu, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to every single ummah, as Allah says, وَلَكَدْ بَعْثَ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا عَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ To every single ummah, Allah ta'ala sent a messenger, okay, with the words, Worship Allah, reject the ta'ghut. This is the core belief of every single religion. Worship Allah and do good actions. So this is the, the belief. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guide us along this path. The path of the best people to walk on the face of this earth. As in that hadith of Ibn Masood, no doubt we know that when Allah Ta'ala assembled all of humanity, He chose from them the best hearts. Those were the hearts He made the Anbiya. And then the next best hearts were their Hawariyun or the Ashab, their companions. And then the rest of us, uh, the rest of the hearts were left as, the, as they were, and that includes ourselves. Okay, so these are the best people. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to guide us along the path. Not of the path of those people who have earned the anger of Allah, the ghadab of Allah, nor those people who have gone astray, the people of Dalala. And so as we know, the Mufassirin, they've agreed that these two groups of people, who are the ones who have earned the anger of Allah? Those who have earned the anger of Allah. And this is really, you know, all this subject, we have to look at it from a clear theological point of view that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is establishing in the Quran and the Sunnah. Those who have earned the anger of Allah are Bani Israel and the Yahud, the Jews. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them more prophets than any other group of people in proportional terms, sent them more suhuf, more books than any other group of people as well. So they were privileged and honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Nabuwa and with Wahi. And so they were given all of this knowledge, but they did not act upon their knowledge. So, you had, so they had knowledge, no action. And then Allah says regarding those people of Dalala, those people who went astray, yani the Nasara, the people who attribute themselves to Isa alayhi salam. Because if it, the thing about the reality of Christianity, as we will see, is that Christianity has actually no basis whatsoever in the actual teachings of Isa alayhi salam. And even Christian scholars themselves, they recognize this. That the New Testament, as it is called, the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke and John, these... Uh, themselves were four individuals who never met Isa alayhi salam. And their accounts themselves of his life and his teachings and themselves they contradict. And they have major differences in themselves. And so what is interesting that this is a religion you could say more or less has been fabricated. So the Nasara or the Christians, those people who claim to follow Isa alayhi salam, are people who have action and no knowledge. So the first is a group of people, knowledge, no action. The second, action and no knowledge. And so it's, you know, this, and in many ways, the story of Isa alayhi salam that is related in the Quran is slightly different from the other Anbiya. With regards to the other Anbiya, and Allah says in the Quran that He has given us these Qasas al-Anbiya, these stories of the Anbiya, for what reason? 
to strengthen the qalb, to develop istiqama and ithbat, firmness. So these are really the ultimate role models for us, the ultimate motivational personalities and inspiration for us. So these stories have been given us to us, why? So that we are inspired by these stories, motivated by these stories, and that they strengthen our heart. Because they, as a group of people, were probably tested more than any other group of people. They had greater challenges than we can even imagine. And so the challenges that they went through, obviously, we learn lessons from them. And you'll find, interestingly, all these different stories, they relate to different events. So, for example, okay, with regards to Yusuf alayhi salam, just a quick point that Yusuf alayhi salam, you know, obviously, look at the persecution. Look at the difference. He's a youth as well. He goes through all of this hardship and difficulty as a young person, being enslaved wrongly, killed, you know, the, his brothers attempt to murder him enslaved wrongly, then he finds himself imprisoned unjustly. Okay, and all this time, he is solid in his character and his resolve, and he is a person who's a magnet to, to other people who come to him for guidance. And then eventually he achieves a position, okay, in the court of the Malik, of the king. So he, as a Muslim, he establishes a position in a non-Muslim kingdom. So how does he deal with that? So interesting, there are lots of uh, you know, guide, pieces of guidance that we extract from this particular story as with all of the other Anbiya. But it's interesting about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relates about Isa alayhi salam, okay, in the Quran about Maryam alayhi salam as well, is less so about the actual story of Isa alayhi salam, more a correction of the distorted aqidah that was promoted obviously by the Nasara and Bani Israel. So more it's, a, it's more of a correction in terms of having the correct understanding of who Isa alayhi salam is. And what this position of him being Al-Masih is as well, being the Messiah, what does it mean? Okay, and obviously what his core message and mission was. So it's more of a clarification of this. And so this also establishes a very important point of action for ourselves. This guidance, this clear guidance that we have been given is for the purpose, for our purpose, so that we may correct the misconception, the distorted notions that have been spread by Isa alayhi salam. So in today's talk, I want to really cover try three aspects. First, I'm going to relate from the Quran those verses which establish the correct aqidah belief in relation to Isa alayhi salam that we are that we hold, and how obviously the different descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa taala relates about Isa. Alayhi. That's first point. Second part, I want to then do a bit of a refutation of the distorted notions that the Christians have in relation to Isa alayhi salam, and the third thing is obviously. You know, the story of Isa alayhi salam also relates to very important events that will take place in the future. Because we know that Isa alayhi salam will return. I like saying this to Christians because I like to see how their face changes. And I say, we love Isa. And he's coming back. Do you know that? I always say that. You know he's coming back? And they say, really? And when he comes back, we're all going to follow him. He's going to be the imam of all of humanity. And they're kind of surprised and scratching their heads. And yes, and also he's going to establish the one religion, Deen al-Haq. And what is it? And so when he comes back, he will break the cross, okay, kill the swine, abolish jizya, establish justice for all of humanity. And we're going to relate this. In particular, when you relate this to Jehovah's Witnesses, you see their face change. Okay, because they're very surprised by this particular story. Also, you know, we relate to the, the Christians that Isa alayhi salam and his mother Maryam alayhi salam, they are beloved to us. Look, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a surah, surah al-Maryam, to just to elevate her position. That's how honored she is in our religion. Again, we surprise them. We say, Isa alayhi salam is beloved to us. You cannot believe unless you believe in him as a messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent. And also that he was born from immaculate conception. Allah, and our relation of the immaculate conception, when we look at it compared to the Christian account, again, you see the beauty of how Allah ta'ala relates. That Allah says, just be. He is the speech of Allah. Allah says, just be, and he was. His likeness in that word is the same as Adam alayhi salam. But Allah ta'ala, he says, just be, and he was conceived in the womb of Maryam alayhi salam. So we believe in the immaculate conception. We also believe in the virgin birth. And again, our account is very different from the nativity and the Christian account as well. We'll go through this particular. So we say, when I say this to them, they are very surprised. That how can you believe in these? These are also tenets that we hold as well. However, where we differ fundamentally from you is that Isa alayhi salam never did he say worship me or take me as the son of Allah or say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a walad, has a son. No, never did he say such a thing. The mountain is prepared to destroy itself that they say that Allah ar-Rahman has a son as Allah says in the Quran. This is how serious this particular matter is as well. So Isa alayhi salam what we say he did not attribute to himself divinity. He did not make himself on the same level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather he was a man. 
And then obviously we find this distorted Akita because of the people's love of Isa al Islam, how they elevated his position. Again, how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made it clear to us on one occasion when he entered into a room with his companions and they all stood up for him as well. And he says, "Do not," he said, "stand up." He told them to sit down. And why he said this? He said, "Do not make ghulu." And Allah says in the Quran, "Ya, ya ahlul uh, kitab, la taghulu fi dinikum." Oh, people of the book, do not exaggerate your religion. Do not make this extreme kind of exaggeration of your religion. He says, do not make ghulu of me. Do not exaggerate my position. I am the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, this is my position. Do not make it higher than as the Nasara did to Isa alayhi salam. And so it's very important that, you know, because of our love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we see this unfortunate aqidah amongst the Muslims today as well. Because of the, and you can't even call this excessive love. Because of their distorted love of, Isa, uh, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How they have given divinity, attributes which belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have given it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. And so for example, this uh, concept of being, for example, ever present and not having died and things like that. When we know the Quran quite clearly states that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is bashar. Numerous places in, in the Quran as well. So this is somewhat surprising when you say to the Christians, okay, that we love Isa alayhi salam. We believe that he was born from immaculate conception, the virgin birth. Okay, Allah said be and he was. And that as al-Masih. And this term al-Masih, that he's the Messiah. What does it mean? It means that he was the anointed one. Like a king was born, they would be rubbed in oil and they would be anointed as well to show their elevated position. And he, Isa alayhi salam obviously was sent as a king. In that regard to Bani Israel as a leader, so he's the anointed one, but also the anointed one and Al-Masih, what it really means is the one who anoints others as well. Yani it means that the Prophet, uh, that Isa alayhi salam was blessed himself. He was, he had, and he, everywhere he went, as Allah mentions, he conferred blessings upon the people as well. So this is his distinction of being Al-Masih, that he was a person who conferred blessings to, the, to humanity. However, the Christians, their belief of Al-Masih is that Messiah means the son of God. So we ask, again, we challenge their notion. Where did this understanding of the term Messiah okay, come from? That they have, they have translated this to mean the Son of God. And when we look at really the origins of Christianity, you'll see how really in many ways they have distorted their religion. You find, for example, that there is nothing which is an original record of the actual sayings of Isa alayhi salam. He spoke a language called Aramaic. Okay, and so you'll find that even the earliest accounts of the Gospels, they are actually written in Syriac or Greek, in, in, in languages that Isa alayhi salam didn't even speak. Anyway, we'll come on to that. And so again, we say that, you know, uh, and another thing which is a core tenet of Christianity, in many ways you could say this is the crux of Christianity as well. This is the resurrection story. Again, this is something that we fundamentally disagree. That Isa alayhi salam was not resurrected, rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up into the heavens. And he remains there until obviously the end of time. Until the time. And this is really the distinction of Imam Mahdi. Because in the time of Imam Mahdi, when Imam Mahdi obviously will be engaged in much struggle for the sake of the Ummah in wars and in battles, and the Ummah really will be at a difficult point. Because obviously this is one of the greatest fitan that will occur. This is the fitna of Dajjal. And you know, this is fitna of Dajjal, brothers, is a very serious matter. That's why the story of Isa al Islam is so important to us. In our salah, in our fard salah, we are required to seek refuge in four things. In the, when we sit in the tashahud, and that of those four things is the fitna of Dajjal. The, even the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, whose imam obviously supersedes ours, they even sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they would live in the time that the Dajjal will come. It may be possible because this is our time or our children's time or our children's children's time. So this is going to be a great time of great fitna upon the earth. And in this time of great fitna, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends this great blessing of Isa alayhi salam back to humanity. Isa alayhi salam will descend in Damascus, in the east of Damascus, at the place where there is the white minar. Some people say this is the Umayyad mosque. Okay, you know, we don't, we don't say exactly that, but it, we, you know, the description is a place where there is a white minar. His hands upon the wings of two angels, descending, wearing two garments, who are, which are lightly dyed of saffron, which is an orangey kind of color. Okay, and there will be perspiration, be beads of perspiration uh, and water, uh, like I said, coming from his hair. And whenever he shakes his hair, they, these beard be they, will, they will come off like beads of pearls. Okay, it will be a blessed sight. And then he will breathe and everyone who smells the breath, every kafir who smells the breath of Isa alayhi salam will die. Then Isa alayhi salam, as we know, will then pray salah behind Imam Mahdi. 
And again, this is one of the distinctions of the Mahdi. Okay, one of the two distinctions, obviously he leads the Muslims in the battle against Rum. And the second distinction is that he leads the Salah and Isa alayhi salam will pray behind him. And this in itself is very symbolic for us. Why? Because what it assumes is that first that the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, when he comes back, he is going to follow the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's not going to come with any new religion. The religion is complete. Allah has already completed the religion. So the religion is complete. The Sharia has been established. And again, his fact, the mere fact that he is going to pray behind the Imam of the Muslims. Although look at that, he is a Nabi. He's come, okay, although he doesn't return back to the earth as a Nabi. He's returned back to the earth more as a Imam. Okay, you know, really look at this distinction that Imam Mahdi will lead Isa alayhi salam in prayer. And when, when Imam Mahdi sees that Islam, he will offer Isa alayhi salam the uh, uh, masalla, but Isa alayhi salam will push him forward. Again, showing that he will not oppose the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, and he conforms to the, the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And then as we know, Isa alayhi salam will then lead his army. He will buy his, uh, his shafa, juj and majuj will be destroyed. And then he will pursue Dajjal. And he will pursue Dajjal to a place called Lud, which is a gate in Tel Aviv. And there he will kill the Dajjal. And, the Jal will, and he was, that will be the first person that he will kill. So again, this, the matter of the story of Isa alayhi salam, it has great significance for us. If we happen to live or experience this particular time, now if it is, then this is a great time of great fitna and Allah Ta'ala sends this as a blessing. Then after, there will be prosperity. Uh, and I'll kind of relate that inshallah uh, towards the end. Of. So, so obviously we can see the matters related to Isa they are of great significance to us. Again, just establish some core principles before we go. First, okay, the Anbiya, they are all brethren. And we do not make any difference between them. All of them had the same mission, the same deen, the same objective, and that is to establish nothing other than Tawheed on the earth. They came as a succession, one after the other, reviving the core message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them. Ani'budullah, wajtanibu ta'ud. And really the essence of Islam, or the simplest description you could say of Islam, is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone with no partners, and then to do good actions. And so all of the Anbiya, they came with this. Obviously, they came with different Sharia. And so with regards to Isa alayhi salam, really he came okay, as a, uh, you know, as a mission to, messenger to affirm the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam. And he came as a reminder, not to all of Alameen, he came just to Bani Israel to establish this core message. Because obviously Bani Israel had rejected. And as we know, even though Allah Ta'ala honored Bani Israel with messengers and with uh, wahi more than any other group of people, they did not act upon their knowledge. They killed their messengers and they opposed their messengers. And their precise opposition to Isa alayhi salam was precisely because of this. Because he came and he changed the, the social order. He revived the core message that Allah Ta'ala had. And obviously this challenged the society. And so again, they tried to oppose him. And then eventually they tried to kill him. And this obviously relates to the story of the, the resurrection where they tried to, uh, to, to crucify him. And Allah Ta'ala then put someone the likeness of Isa alayhi salam instead. Now, so the, the core message of Isa, Isa alayhi salam is the same message as all of the Umbra. And this is our kind of core belief for us as well. Now, what is important for us is that how do we then treat the, what, is, what is the significance of the Injil to us then? And in particular, as we know, what is often related to us, the Israeliya. What is the position? How do we take, for example, the so-called teachings of Isa alayhi salam today? So what is the position in relation to the New Testament and the Old Testament for us? And so the important principles that are for us to know is this. That with regards to the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament, we do not affirm it, nor do we negate it. What agrees with the Kitab and the Sunnah is something that we accept, but we don't fully affirm it as the Haqq that has been revealed by Allah Ta'ala. Obviously, what doesn't conform to this, we reject this as well. And so this is very important for us because brothers, sometimes they get caught up in fitna by going to the Israelia and thinking that they can freely narrate from the Israelia or the accounts from the children of Israel. As we know in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, the Jewish tribes were there and they had the stories of these Jewish, Jewish tribes. And again, there was the Prophet ﷺ exercised caution in terms of taking, okay, un, you know, taking without 
Okay, checking the, you know, obviously the, uh, the uh, correctness of that in relation to the Kitab and the Sunnah in particular. So, you know, this is our position in relation to, to the teachings of Isa alayhi salam. Obviously, the generic teachings which conform to the Sharia that we have, these are good and inspirational teachings for us, okay, that we accept in the, in the general sense of it. But we do not absolutely affirm this because, as we know, the teachings or the, the Gospels that were given to him, Okay, there has been a what we call a tahrif or a distortion in terms of this particular revelation. So we do not have the actual authentic account of what Isa alayhi salam has actually said. Now again, if we go uh, kind of, uh, if we look at where do therefore the te so-called the teachings of Isa alayhi salam come from? And in many ways, when we compare this to obviously the hadith of the Prophet we can see the great ni'mah or the great blessing that Allah Ta'ala has given us by preser preserved, preserving our religion. As I mentioned, the Gospels, they are uh, accounts by four people, none of whom actually met the, uh, Isa alayhi salam, most who lived after him between the years of 30 to 100 years after Isa alayhi salam. And it is their account, second, third, sometimes fourth hand account of the life of Isa alayhi salam. And like I said, within the Gospels, there are many, many contradictions. And I won't really go through this. I'll leave you. If anyone wants to do it, go read, see an Ahmed Ida leaflet. There are many things in there about these contradictions. But here what we see is that these individuals, they related the lives of Isa alayhi salam without any sanad, without any chain, chains of transmission that go back to the actual teachings of what Isa alayhi salam said on his mouth. Whereas when we say, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa look at that. This is a statement where we can attribute it all the way back through a sanad, through a chain of transmission, all the way back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a great book. And this chain of transmission is something that we can be scientifically uh, verified okay, and authenticated as well. So therefore, ilm al-rijal, which is the science of uh, the narrators of the hadith, you could say, what it shows is how one person narrated to another person, narrated to another person, how these people met each other and had authority to narrate from one another. So again, it shows the authenticity of the hadith and how robust this is as a statement of the Prophet ﷺ. If, for example, there is a weakness in the Sanad, i.e. the people never met each other, or they were weak in memory, then again, the scholars of Hadith, they categorized the Hadith accordingly between Sahih and between Da'if and all various other kind of categories as well. And so look at this, this was a, as a science. This is the science which preserves the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ and makes them absolutely robust. So we know that this was the actual saying, action, or approval of the Prophet ﷺ. Christianity, on the other hand, can have no claim to this whatsoever because the whole premise of how these teachings were, were preserved was not through any robust chains of narration as well. Then to add to that, the actual accounts of the life of Isa salam, okay, were actually compiled many, many centuries after Isa salam was taken up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone got an idea how... Uh, the Gospels when they were actually formally compiled. Anyone got an idea? 100 years? No. 300 years? Did someone say three? It's actually in the fourth century, yes, around 300, year 325 uh, after death. And there was something called the Councils of Nicaea. Has anyone heard of this council, Councils of Nicaea? Anyone heard of this? Yeah, some brothers have heard of this. And this is a really interesting point, again, in which we engage the Christians in terms of uh, a debate as well. Because we, we ask them, what is the authenticity of your revelation? Where does this actually come from? We say the Quran revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the speech of Allah ta'ala speaking directly to us hasn't been changed, preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And so this is, a, this is a very robust thing to say. In comparison, your revelation, it has no, you, cannot ha you, you have no proof to say this was the actual teachings of Isa alayhi salam. And in fact, what we, what we know, and this is in all the encyclopedias of Christianity, encyclopedia of Catholicism, you look in their own books, uh, you'll see they themselves will say, Nicaea, which took place in the three, year 2325, was a council that was uh, established to basically compile the Gospels. And so they had many, many accounts of the life of Isa alayhi salam, and they decided to choose these four and reject all of the others. Now, what was the authority? We ask the Christians, what was the authority in which you base your decision? And in many ways, what we see, this whole authority in which they be behave their decision, okay, was really to change or adapt the religion to suit their own desires. In particular, by this time, okay, the Roman Empire had accepted Christianity as their state religion. And in order to do so, they completely changed the teachings of Isa alayhi salam. They Romanized them. So this is where we find, for example, okay, the eating of swine, khanzir. 
Okay, the concept of the Trinity, which was a Roman concept. Worship on the Sunday, whereas Isa alayhi salam, as we know, his day of rest was Yom al-Sabt, on the Sabbath. All of these things were Roman customs and Roman uh, traditions. And in order to make the religion of Isa alayhi salam more acceptable to the Romans, they Romanized the religion. They completely transformed it to make it acceptable so that people would embrace it from the Roman Empire. And then it became, and these four Gospels were the accounts which most, most were conducive to this and supported this as well. Whereas as we know, Isa alayhi salam, he was a, from Bani Israel and his traditions were from the Bani Israel. But the Romans, they didn't want to do circumcision. They didn't want to eat uh, okay, meat which was halal and things like that. Rather, they wanted the religion. And so in many ways, there's a very important lesson for us in this because we find likewise, there have been many, many attempts to make this tahrif or distortion of the kitab, the book of Allah, and to distort Islam from, its, from the true sunnah. So we have people, for example, who are munkar al-hadith, people who reject the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They are similar to, obviously, uh, the councils of Nicaea, because what they're saying is that uh, we will take the authority of the Qur'an, but we reject the explanation of the sunnah as the tafsir of the Qur'an. And obviously, by doing that, whose explanation do they replace it with? They replace it, therefore, with their own kind of explanation as well. So we find these kind of movements also have existed with, in, with Within, uh, amongst the Muslims as well in their attempt to obviously to distort Islam to assimilate it and make it more acceptable to their culture as well so Council of Nicaea interestingly this is a attempt by Christianity to uh, to devise the Gospels but they were very selective in terms of what we do so and then from that point onwards what we have are these four Gospels which are the account of Israel Islam and all of the other accounts then were kind of disappeared then on top of that the early Christian communities who were actually true followers of Isa alayhi salam, they were the ones and, and, and who st were sticking to Tawheed and to the teachings that he had given. These were the communities that were persecuted, were tortured, and were killed by the latter Christians as well. So this is, when you look in the history of Christianity, okay, you see this is, is the case as well. Okay, uh, again, uh, just a few more points. When Isa alayhi salam, when he returns, he will follow the religion of Islam, and this will be the only deen. And the return of Isa alayhi salam, I've kind of, kind of touched on as well. In relation to, uh, touched on the concept of the immaculate conception that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be, and he was. And so, again, from uh, the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon Isa alayhi salam. Again, this, one of the, the first miracle is that Isa alayhi salam, he spoke from the cradle. And so how Allah Ta'ala relates in Surah Al-Maryam that when Maryam Alayhi Salaam had given birth, obviously the people, when she brought the child to the people, they said, how can you be this? You were a chaste woman, you know, you're a woman of great honor. And how do you bring this disrepute? And then we find this miracle that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala conferred upon Isa Alayhi Salaam that he spoke from the cradle and he affirms that he is Rasulullah, that he is a messenger, has come from Allah as well. Uh, and there are many other miracles that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala conferred upon Isa Alayhi Salaam. Okay, inshallah, we'll kind of touch on them in a minute as well. But in relation to the Immaculate Conception, obviously this also establishes very importantly the position of Maryam alayhi salam. Again, in our religion, okay, how the Prophet said that Maryam alayhi salam is the most perfect woman. So she is the most perfect woman that there has been. She was the daughter of Imran, taught by Zakaria, her cousin. And so she really is a role model for all okay, uh, women as well. As we know, the four perfect women were uh, Maryam alayhi salam, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, Khadija radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of, uh, the wife of the Prophet and then the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These were the four perfect women, okay, that, that, that have, uh, that, you know, have, have existed as well. So obviously Maryam we, is Afzal, she has the distinction of being the most perfect of all of those as well. In terms of what the attribution that is made to Isa alayhi salam today, obviously people attribute to him this falsehood of uh, being the son of Allah or being Allah himself. As we know, uh, Isa alayhi salam himself, okay, he uh, distances himself from this false claims. And what we find also is that there were many Christians who also share this correct aqidah as well. Not all Christians today have this aqidah that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God or is Allah. So many Christians themselves, they reject this uh, kind of concept. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in relation to Ahlul Kitab that one of the important things for us to do is to call them and to, to a common word. So one of the things that we find is that the common thing between us and the Nasara and the Christians, we have a common, a few common. Well, first is that we believe in one God or they claim to believe in one God. Second is that obviously both of us hold Isa alayhi salam in a very important position as well. So this is the foundation in which we have some kind of dialogue with them. And just to kind of elaborate. So for example, first point, in relation to believing in Allah. So as we know, both ourselves and the Christians say we believe in Allah. And we both, even the Christians themselves, will say that we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal, absolute, and is in need of nothing. 
These are just three things that all Christians will believe in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eternal, absolute, and in need of nothing. Three things. And so, obviously, this is, uh, you know, in conformance with our agreement. And so we ask him, okay, so you say that Allah is eternal, absolute, and in need of nothing. So how is it that you give, therefore, divinity to Isa, alayhi salam? You give him the attribute of also being, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. When Isa, alayhi salam himself was finite, he was limited, and he was constrained. That Isa, alayhi salam, himself, in, within the, uh, uh, your own accounts, how you describe Isa, alayhi salam, as becoming tired, as sleeping, as needing sustenance as well, as being born, as one who's died and crucified as well. So again, this negate, this core concept of the eternal, absolute, and uh, like I said, uh, uh, unlimited nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it completely negates this because it makes Allah finite, limited, and constrained as well. So this is, again, one premise in which we can obviously challenge uh, the, the views of the Christian. Christians as well. And also just to relate, as we know in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, again Christianity was widespread. And in particular, when we know when we see the first Hijra, the Prophet ﷺ, he sent the first group of Muslims to Habash, to Ethiopia. And in particular to Najashi there, who was a just king. And we know the story how Jafar ibn Abi Talib, when he uh, 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 presents the message of Islam to Najashi. And then as we know, the Quraysh, they came to obviously bring, you know, to uh, corrupt the mind of Najashi. And one of the things they said, you do not know what the things that they say about Isa alayhi salam. That they say that he is just a messenger of Allah, okay, and that he is not the son of Allah and, uh, and things like this. And, uh, and then he calls Jafar ibn Abi Talib and said, what do you say? He says, yes, we say precisely this, that he was born of immaculate conception, that he was the speech, uh, he was born from the speech of Allah, and it was, and that he was the messenger of Allah and he is not Okay, Allah himself and Najashi also, he affirmed this as well. And as we know, when Najashi, when he passed away, the angels, they related this news to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, and then the Prophet ﷺ prayed his janazah as well. So you find that there are Christians who will uh, uh, have these particular views. So when we see this distortion of the aqidah of the, uh, of the Christians in relation to Isa Islam, what is important for us is first to be aware of these distortions and secondly, not to imitate them in any way. So as we know, don't imitate the Christians. And interestingly, the, the Prophet Sallallahu himself, he says, do not imitate the people who have gone before you. Okay, you know, he said that, you know, in, in many hadith, he's mentioned how you said you will imitate the, the people who have gone before you uh, in our hand span for hand span, foot span for foot span. So if one of them goes down the lizard's hole, you will also follow this person down the lizard's hole as well. So many of us have heard this to these. And interestingly, in the explanation of this hadith, it's mentioned this is a particular lizard which lives in the desert. And it's a particularly ugly in its appearance. It's an unattractive little uh, creature, and the hole is particularly small. So despite the creature being ugly and the hole being small, you will still imitate them and you will still go down the littered hole with them as well. That's how it goes. Even so, what it means is that no matter how unattractive their views are, no matter how reprehensible or, or illogical their beliefs are, unfortunately, the Muslims will end up following these as well. So who, and who, he said, who are you referring to? He said, nothing other than the Yahud and the Nasara, the Jews and the Christians. So it's important for us to not to imitate the Jews and the, and the Christians. And in particular, when we talk about this matter of tashbih of the kuffar, we're not talking about it just in the physical sense. Sometimes brothers say, oh, it's in relation to the matters of dress or outward appearance. No. It's most importantly in relation to the aqidah. And then obviously our general kind of conduct as well. This is what it fundamentally refers to as well. So do not imitate them in terms of their belief. So for example, obviously the exaggeration due to the love, Okay, of, uh, uh, of Isa alayhi salam, we find the people exaggerate the problem uh, and make this ukhulu and give divinity. The, the Jews did this to Uzair, or who is known as Ezra. They said he was the son of Allah, so they elevated his position. Okay, and we find again some groups amongst the Muslims how they elevate Rasulullah sallallahu with this position as well. And as we know also how the Shia they do this with regards to Ahl bayt in Ali radiallahu in particular, and they give him also the attributes of Allah. So we find again this strong warning to us not to imitate, even to the extent that Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu there's a statement he said many of uh, many Muslim will die with a sifat or a characteristic of the Yahud and the Nasara, and they don't even know it. So it's a very serious matter, and they don't even know it. So these sifat, these characteristics, are as began with first, knowledge and no action, or action and no knowledge, or having this particular kind of distortion in relation to the aqidah as well. 
So just to go through some of the ayat now in particular. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he mentions that he gives glad tidings of Isa alayhi salam. How he mentions Surah Maryam, O Maryam, verily Allah gives you the glad tidings of a word, be and he was from him. His name will be Al-Masih, Isa alayhi salam, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. And he will, he will be one of those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this glad tidings to Maryam alayhi salam. And then Jibra'il alayhi salam, Allah mentions in Surah Al-Anbiya, Jibra'il alayhi salam came to Maryam alayhi salam and he gives his glad tidings and he, and he uh, as is related there, he uh, breathed down her sleeve, okay, and this was enough for her then to conceive. And Allah says, be, and it was. So this is the account that we have in the Quran in terms of the immaculate conception. This contrasts with the Christian account because in the Christian account, they, uh, they relate that Maryam alayhi salam was actually impregnated is actually impregnated by the angel. And really this in many ways is a very dishonorable way of looking at it. Okay, and, a very, and it shows you the tahrif or the distortion that they have in their mind. They've really made it, you can see that they've completely distorted. They say, okay, she was born from immaculate conception. No man has touched her. The angel was sent to her. Therefore, how did she then conceive? And so they believe that the angel actually impregnated her. Rather, obviously, we, uh, you know, as Allah has corrected this belief, Jibreel, uh, Jibreel, uh, Jibreel merely breathed down her sleeve, and the hukum of Allah be kun, and it was uh, be, uh, uh, be, and it was. This is how Isa alayhi salam was uh, uh, conceived. And then Allah says, He will speak to people in the cradle and in manhood, and He will be amongst the righteous. So again, Allah relates Himself this miracle that Isa alayhi salam He spoke from the cradle. There are a couple of accounts where Allah Ta'ala, he conferred this miracle, as we know, regarding Ashab al-Ukhdud as well. Okay, the people of the ditch. is that very well-known hadith that many of us are familiar with. And interestingly, Ashab al-Ukhdud, who were they? Do people know who this particular group of Ashab al-Ukhdud were? That Allah relates in Surah al-Buruj. Who were they, anyone? Which community were they? Where did they reside? We don't know. You have heard Ashab al-Ukhdud, yes? The companions, the people of the ditch. You know that there was a king and a ditch was dug, fire was lit, the believers were lined up, they were thrown into the fire and they did not give up their faith. So this was a, again, the, a number of accounts who this community are, but this was a early believing Christian community who were then persecuted by their king who was, uh, who, who was uh, Yahud. And there is a mother, she has her child with her and she's being lined up to be thrown into this fire. So you know the brother's thought, and then that child spoke to your mother, he said, Oh mother, be firm, you are upon the truth. So again, this is another one of those uh, uh, the miracles where the child, okay, Allah conferred this miracle where the child spoke from the cradle as well, and Isa alayhi salam. In relation to the Immaculate Conception, Allah says, okay, she said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? He said, so it will be, for Allah creates what he wills. When he has decreed something, he says to it only be, and it is. Okay, he, Alisa, and then Allah says, He, Ali Isa, alayhi salam, verily I am a slave of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. So again, Isa, alayhi salam, affirming that he is the abd of Allah, that he did not exaggerate his own position as well. And again, this nature of Isa, alayhi salam, again, from, one of, from the, what Allah Ta'ala, what is related about Isa, alayhi salam, is that was his zuhud in particular. Allah Ta'ala not only conferred great miracle, mir miracles, these mu'jizah upon him, as he converted it upon the, the Anbiya as well, Allah, as he said, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, every Anbiya was given a confirming miracle. And by virtue of this miracle, okay, the people affirmed their faith in this message. And so we know what was Musa Alayhi Salaam's miracle. Anyone tell me Musa Alayhi Salaam's miracle? Okay, magic, yes, amongst the staff and also the other things. So he threw his staff down, okay, and then the, his staff turned to a serpent. And the other thing is he put his hand into his uh, garment when he removed it, he re came back and it was white and then he you know, replaced it and it returned back to its original color. So this is Musa alayhi salam, the miracles that Allah Ta'ala gave upon Isa alayhi salam, what were they? What was the one that he was given? Healing, he was given the miracle, miracle of healing in particular as well. Also, how Allah Ta'ala gave him this miracle of taking a bird which was clay and that he breathed upon it and in Allah, it became a live bird as well. Even though his ayat were clear, the disbelievers in the time, as we know, they still, no matter, even if Allah Ta'ala sends down his miracle from the sky, they still won't believe it because that true Iman isn't there. So he was given, and then as we know, the greatest ijaz, and I'll leave it for the brothers next week, the greatest miracle is the miracle that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, al-ijaz, what is this? Miracle that was given to the Prophet. What is it? 
Al-Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so just on this point here, the miracles that were given to these respective anbiya, you see, in many ways, these are conferring miracles. So Musa alayhi salam in his time, the magicians, they were the elite. They were regarded as the people of knowledge in the court of Fir'aun. Fir'aun used the magicians to consolidate his power and to suppress the people and obviously reinforce his kufr. So uh, they were the people of elite, the people of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conferred this ability upon Musa alayhi salam. So when he confronted the magicians, as we know, they threw down their staffs. They all turned into serpents. He throws down his staff and it turns into a serpent which, con which consumes all of the other serpents. When the magicians saw this, what did they do, brothers? What did they do? They all believed in Musa alayhi salam. Then Fir'aun saw that they had gone against him and he executed all of them. So because why? Because they had knowledge. They realized that we have reached the elite in this. We have, have the most knowledge in this particular field. And what he has done, no human can do. Therefore, this, this ability that he has has only been conferred upon him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They saw this, they saw this sign, they believed. And they were executed, then they became shaheed, subhanAllah. Okay, so this is, uh, and likewise in the time of Isa alayhi salam, the healers were the elite. And then Musa, uh, Isa alayhi salam comes, he made the blind man see. He cured the leper. He made the dead man come back to life as well, subhanAllah. All by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, so the people saw this, he said that the healers saw this, and he said this is only someone who has, okay, truly, uh, you know, uh, been given this power by the creator of the heavens and the earth. So they conferred it. And likewise with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the people of elite were who? In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Okay, the poets. And the Arabic language had received such an excellent level. Okay, it was the, you know, most advanced language of the time. And so when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi spoke these ayah, the poets themselves realized this is from, only from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Because no one else is capable of having this perfect speech. Uh, and again, this is very big talk in itself. Now the point about these conferring miracles is this. Again, what we learn from this is that these karamat, as we know, the, the, uh, the mu'jiza is a miracle that is conferred upon a nabi. Whereas a karamat is a, an event that takes place, is a miraculous event that Allah confers upon an ordinary person, you could say. How do we know that somebody is truly gifted with a, with a, this, a miracle or a miracle? How do we know that someone is truly gifted with this? And this is what uh, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he, in his book Al-Furqan. Anyone read Al-Furqan, this book? Okay, okay. Anyone read this book on Al-Furqan? He talks about uh, Awliya of Shaitan and Awliya of Ar-Rahman. And he talks about what really are the conditions to, con to, to confirm whether this is a miraculous event or not. And so one of the things that he says is that we can say that this is a miraculous event based upon what the call of that individual is. So if by this miraculous event, the individual is calling people to affirm their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we can say, yes, this is more likely to be a miraculous event that someone has converted. If by this miraculous event, he is calling people to awliya of shaitan and to disobey the sharia of Allah, Okay, then we know that this is not a miraculous event. So Abdul Qadir Jalani, rahimahullah, as we know, there are many miraculous events that are... And he was an imam of the sunnah. Many miraculous events that were attributed to him. And as we know that his true teachings is that he, this was what he called people to reinforce their tawheed and strengthen the iman in Allah and following the, the sharia of Allah. In fact, in Tilbis Iblis, there's a story where, uh, I, I can't remember who it, who it is, I don't know if it's Abdul Qadir Jalani, rahimahullah, where, uh, uh, you know, he's sleeping under a tree, and then there's a light above the tree and it's saying, you know, it's saying, okay, uh, oh, Abdul Qadir, this is your Lord. And for you, he has forgiven you for two of your daily salah. And so this is a, and we see, we hear these crazy stories all the time. He's forgiven you of your two salah. And some people, they hear these and they say, subhanAllah, Abdul Qadir, he said, A'udhu billahi min ash shaitan rajim I seek refuge in Allah from shaitan, the cursed, and rejected by Allah. Not even did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confer this upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa how can he confer this upon me? And so this was only a deception of shaitan as well. But interestingly, most people are deceived. Shaitan, he uses what appears to be miraculous events to deceive people. Be it holy tomatoes or aubergines, which have the words on them and things like this. People, the iman is more in these things than obviously the true okay, knowledge and uh, the, the wahi that Allah, and the knowledge that Allah Ta'ala has given us. I don't know if some people remember a couple of years ago, the people who were the Hindus and their gods, their idols, they started to drink milk. Yeah, some people might remember these. And so, you know, the people who spread this rumor were all the grocery sellers in South Hall. I remember they, all their milk sold out that same day. They sold everything out, you know. So, so who knows who spread these rumors? And, uh, and I remember, so is this a miraculous event or is this from shaitan? We say this is from shaitan. Why? Because it's guiding the people towards shirk rather than tawheed, away from the sharia of Allah to misguidance. 
And in particular, one of the things I remember the person who was saying that they were doing these things, they were saying, okay, our God is hungry. We need to feed our God. Now, if you have a hungry God, how can you ask this God, the attribute to this God that it is Rabbil Alameen, and you say, you know, bestow upon us risk, when your God itself is, is, uh, is hungry and thirsty. So it's ajeeb. But this goes to show you the, how people, Allah has given us clear guidance for the Anbiya, and yet how the people's views they themselves become distorted. Uh, Allah Ta'ala says regarding uh, Isa alayhi salam in, in Surah al ankabut and he made me blessed wherever I be and he has joined upon me salah and zakah as long as I live. So here this is uh, again, th this is the, uh, again, Ibn Rajab, Ibn Al-Qayyum also relate to this that Isa alayhi salam, his life was a blessed life. Everywhere he went, every person he contacted with, he conferred blessings. And so if we follow the way of Isa alayhi salam, we can also do this. How? And this really, and he said, it's, it's, uh, we can also be people where everywhere we go, we confer blessings. How? Through da'wah ilallah. And that's what Allah Ta'ala says. قَلِمَةً طَيْبَةً كَشَجْرَةٍ طَيْبَةٍ أَصْرُهَ ثَابِتٌ وَفَرْءُهُ فِي السَّمَاءِ That a good word is like a good tree. Its roots, they go deep into the ground and its uh, branches, they stretch out far, giving good fruit. And, you know, so this uh, is this, how Allah Ta'ala, he relates. That just by peeping people who in society, just confer the blessings of this da'wah. Kalimatan tayyibatan, a good word is a sadaqah. Something, something which reminds someone to worship Allah Ta'ala or encourages them towards that which is good. Just through making da'wah, calling people to da'wah, calling people to Islam, okay, is a way that we follow in the way of the Anbiya. Just as the Prophet said, Kul hadhi sabili adu ilallah ala basira ana wa manat tabani. Say, this is my way, I call to only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sure knowledge. I and those people who follow me. So you want to have the same life of being one who is blessed? Then it's very simple. It's being upon the path of da'wah, the path of serving insan, just as the Anbiya did. Now remember the saying of Malcolm X, okay, Rahman in particular, one of the things he said was that if Isa, Musa السلام, and Isa السلام, and the Prophet السلام, were here today, where would we find them? Where would we find them engaged in terms of their mission? Okay, with the people, where would we find them? Okay, because all of them were people of zuhd, people who abstained themselves, were not concerned with the dunya or with them. In particular, Isa alayhi salam was a person of great aestheticism, of great zuhd and abstinence and no concern for the matters of the dunya. And likewise, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi as well. Zahid truly in the sense that even that the Prophet when he would sleep, he would sleep upon a bed made of reeds, it would leave an imprint upon his body. And when the companion said to him, let us lay for you a soft bed, he said, I have nothing to do with this world. I'm just a rider who is riding, we'll get up and we'll continue my journey. So this is the Prophet Sallallahu nothing to do with this dunya. He left this world, when he left this world, okay, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in his own home, in the wives of the uh, Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, okay, there was not even any provision in, the, in, in his own home, SubhanAllah. So this goes to show you, even though he had at this time the wealth of all Arabia presented at his feet, yet he left this world with nothing. And likewise, Isa alayhi salam, this same attribute. So this question, brothers, if Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet where we were here today in that sense, where would they be? Where would their mission? Which people would they be associated with? Tell me. Amongst the miskeen. Okay, and that's exactly what Malcolm X said. He said they would be on the street with the homeless. With those people. So this is, the, this is their sunnah. This is their way. Again, how they conferred blessings to humanity as well. Uh, and so also Allah says, again, salamun upon uh, uh, Isa alayhi salam. His mission as well, Allah how mentions uh, again in Surah Al-Ankabut. So worship him alone. I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the straight path uh, that which he has adorned for the prophets. Now, so this in particular, that uh, Isa alayhi salam, he called, that sirat mustaqim, he called people to the straight path. Okay, this path of Tawheed, this path of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now interestingly, there is a very famous verse that, uh, or, that most of the Christians, they use, okay, and they say that he is the way, okay, I can't remember what is it is, uh, Isa alayhi salam is the way uh, to Allah or something like that. I can't remember, it's coming out of my mind, yeah. But, you know, and the, the whole point of this particular verse, verse is that say, he's the only way to Allah. I.e. through this, what they're saying is that Isa alayhi salam, he died for the sins of humanity. And by taking him as your savior, that he is the way okay, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what they're saying is that you have to accept him as divine. This is one of the things that they say. And, one of the, and, and so one of the criticisms of the, of, the, of the Christians in particular is that when they explain their revelation, so when they take out verses from the Gospels, which sunnah do they use to put this into a context? 
Can anyone explain? Which sunnah do they use to put into the NA context? Whose sunnah are they using? Who's, who's understanding? Okay, oh, uh, the, you know, uh, are they using? Anyone? They're really using their own. So they're making what we call this, uh, uh, this is false ta'wil. Okay, false interpolation. Because really they have no, you see, the thing about the ayat of Allah, and this is why the sunnah is the explanation of the Quran, because it explains the sabab, or we call asbab al nuzul the particular event and situation in which the verse was revealed. So for example, our young brothers who misunderstand the verses on jihad, that they recognize, they think that these verses are am, they are just applied in a general sense, don't realize many of them are khas, they are related to particular events and situations related to the battles of the Prophet And so they have a specific context, if those situation applies, then we apply the verse appropriately. However, when the Christians come to explaining their Injil, they have no concept of what the suburb is. And they use their own ta'wil to explain, say he is the way and the only way, i.e. So they say that he Ali himself, okay, is the one who is blessed and, and divine. So they've put their own interpretation on it. And so you can challenge them again by saying that when you explain your verses of the Injil, what, where is the traditions, where is the actual teachings of Isa alayhi salam, which says this is the context of the verse. Even when you say this term, what is the context of this verse of your Injil, they will become confused and they will scratch their heads because they have no way to get back to the suburb or the context of their verse. They have no way to do it. Even go to their padres, their ministers, their scholars and say that verse, say he's the way and the only way. Okay, ask them what is the context of the verse and they will never be able to find it because they have no sunnah or no corroborating proof there. And so they themselves make this ta'wil Okay, that the, uh, the context of this word, verse is that he was divine and so the only way to worship Allah is by taking him as your savior and making wasila through Isa alayhi salam rather than directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is again, uh, uh, you know, when Allah says that Isa alayhi salam, he goes, we know what the straight path is because the, Allah has made it very clear to us what the straight path is. Then Allah says, and they say that the most beneficent has begotten a son, as the Jews said, okay, uh, and the pagan Arabs say that he has begotten daughters. Okay, indeed, this is a terrible lie, and that the heavens are torn apart, and the earth is, a play, is about to split asunder, and the mountains fall in rules, that they ascribe a son to Ar-Rahman. Okay, uh, so this is what Allah Ta'ala, again, he says, that this is a terrible lie. So again, just in this matter, and as we know, look, brothers, Christmas, the Christmas story, the nativity story is really the story of the divinity or that the son of, uh, of, uh, of, all, of God is born on earth. And also the other key uh, element of Christianity is the crucifixion story which takes place in Easter on Good Friday. So these are the two kind of key kind of uh, uh, tenets of Christianity. Now our community, and it happens every year, and in fact I've seen it happening more and more every year in particular. And this is the thing that we find more of our community are engaging in the practice of Christmas. And the, therefore, this assumes that the aqidah or the correct understanding is becoming weaker and weaker as the generations of the Muslims goes on. And we see that these practice, and we find Muslims have no problem sending Christmas cards to each other, engaging in Christmas parties, sending presents to each other and things like that, or even saying happy Christmas to... Uh, yeah. And they do it, some do it because of an inferiority complex they have, some because they just want to adapt to the situation, most because they're just jahil of what the implications of what they are actually saying. Not even that, worse than that, we find in many schools where our Muslim children are in primary schools, you'll find that there will be, especially in majority Muslim schools, you'll find that there will be nativity plays that are taking place. And in these nativity plays, you'll find that the Muslim children will be playing the roles within these nativity plays as well, of Maryam and of Joseph, whoever Joseph is in this particular story, okay, and the three wise men and things like this. Is this does this happen here in Birmingham, brothers? Yes? And so this shows, okay, some schools, some it doesn't happen, and others, unfortunately, it does happen. In fact, the school, uh, one of the schools in Bradford, where they asked my advice, I said, really, the majority of the Muslim kids are Muslim. This is completely against their values, and so really, you shouldn't have this, because it's like almost me asking a Christian to do something completely against their religion. You wouldn't, accept it, you wouldn't find this acceptable. So why are you asking Muslim children to do that? So they went and consulted with the parents, and the parents said, no, we want to do this. We also celebrate the birthday of Isa, alayhi salam. He is a prophet, and we celebrate the birthdays of the prophet, subhanAllah. So this is is uh, the misguidance that we find unfortunately and then they started arguing no I want my daughter to pay Maryam and things like this so Ajib Allah Ta'ala says that the mountain and the heavens and the earth will destroy them that sells that they say Allah has a son that Allah has a son and yet our hearts 
they don't have any problem with this. So again, it shows that we have a very important job in terms of having establishing uh, this correct understand, understanding. Also, Allah Ta'ala, he says, Ya Ahlul Kitab, la taghlu fi dinukum. Okay, oh uh, people of the scriptures, do not exceed the limits of your religion. And say only that Isa ibn Maryam is uh, the messenger of Allah, uh, and uh, a messenger of Allah and his word be, and it was, and he, uh, which was bestowed upon Maryam, and a spirit created by him, so believe in Allah and the Messenger. Say not that he is the Trinity, one amongst three. Uh, cease it is better for you, for Allah is the one. Uh, glory be to him uh, above having a son. To him belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth, and Allah is all sufficient and a disposer of all affairs. So this story of the Trinity, Allah Ta'ala himself in Surah Al-Nisa rejects this idea that don't say Allah Ta'ala is one of three. So this concept of the Trinity itself it is a Roman concept. It just did not exist in the early Christian communities. The true followers of Islam, they rejected, obviously they had a correct understanding of Tawheed. And this concept of uh, uh, the Trinity, does anyone understand, does anyone know where this concept of the Trinity came from? Okay, pagans, okay, Christian, Christ, as we know, Christmas is a pagan, but we know it came from the pagan, but who in particular, where in particular did it come from? No, not the Egyptians, no. Okay, Rome, did someone say Rome? Yeah? Okay, so the concept of the Trinity was a Roman concept. They believed in a Trinity of three gods as the most important. So again, in order to make Christianity acceptable to the Romans, they incorporated the, this concept of the Trinity. And so they divided okay, the concept of Tawheed into three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and so they say that he's the Father, Allah, he's the Spirit, and, that he's, and again, there's again a complete distortion uh, of, of, this, uh, of, the, of the message of Tawheed. And at the same time, obviously, they attribute themselves that, uh, that they are people who believe in one God, although they, like I said, uh, uh, give divinity okay, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give that to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, they make shirk al-akbar in, in relation to this as well. And again, this is a basis on which we can challenge them. And also Isa Islam, never did he say, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'arad, never did I say anything except uh, okay, you, uh, that, that which you commanded me, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord, and I was a witness of them while I dwelt amongst them. Isa alayhi salam, he came to confirm the Torah and he came also to give the glad tidings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi So he came to give the glad tidings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi And in fact, we find in Deuteronomy, again, there is references to the one who will come from the land of Mecca. He's called the Paraclete. So there are all these references that we find in Deuteronomy in particular. So Allah Ta'ala, he mentions in Surah Al-Safu, إِذْ قَالَ إِسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ مُسَدِّكَ لِمَا بَيْنِ يَدَيْ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتِ وَمُبَشِّرٌ بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِن بَعْدِ إِسْمَهُ أَحْمَدٍ فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ قَالُوا هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ And remember when Isa alayhi salam said, O children of Israel, I am a messenger unto you, conforming the Torah which came before me and giving, giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me. I, and his, whose name shall be Ahmed, yani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But when Ahmed came to them with clear proofs, they said, this is plain magic. So again, part of the distinction of Isa alayhi salam is that he came to confer, okay, the glad tidings of the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we put this into one historical context, this becomes even more clear. Between Isa alayhi salam being raised up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how many years brothers? 600 years, 600 of years with no messenger sent upon the earth and only false religion okay, and uh, the way of Taqut and Shaitan being promoted. So this was probably you could say one of the darkest periods in humanity. The darkest, now you can't say it's similar to us because now Alhamdulillah we have the Wahi, we have the revelation and we have the guy and we have mass media which promotes this as well. But this is a period in time where people, and so we find that the religion had become completely distorted for the whole, so the worst period of humanity and as we know the Arab, they were Mushrikun, okay, and then you had the, the Persians who were fire worshippers, we had the Romans and the Byzantine Empire who were who Christians and distorted. So the true followers were so few and far between for humanity. And so therefore, the birth of the Prophet وسلم, and the coming of this wahi, and therefore, Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi, this revelation, this is a cataclysmic event, phenomenal event for the whole of humanity. The age of darkness is lifted, and Allah Ta'ala has sent this guy, light, light of guidance to the whole of humanity as well. And so, the Isa was like foreteller of those worlds, uh, the, the coming. 
In terms of the resurrection, as I mentioned, we completely reject that Isa alayhi salam was killed upon the cross. So again, this is a very core aspect of Christianity, the whole crucifixion story, very fundamental aspect of Christianity. Because through this, they say that the suffering that Isa alayhi salam went through in relation to the crucifixion, because of all, no one suffered like this. Because of this, all of the sins of humanity were forgiven, that he died on the cross, so you accept him as your savior and, savior and you are forgiven as well. So this is the Christian belief. Now let's completely challenge the whole assumption of this belief. First, as we know, everyone is responsible for their own actions. This idea that Isa alayhi salam died for your sins, okay, we find amongst the Christians, they have this belief that they only worship Allah with mahabba and they have forgotten khawf. We, when we worship Allah, we worship Allah with love, hope and fear. Three things, they balance each other up. If you just worship Allah with love, as the Christians, they say that love Jesus and that's it. He died for your sins. Sins, then where is your khawf? Where is the fear that will keep you away from the fahisha and the haram? And in between is raja, the hope. And so because of this aqidah of the Christians, we find that they have this murjia aspect to them as well. They have this belief, I believe that Isa salam died for my sins and that's all I need to believe to be saved. And they don't do actions themselves. Unfortunately, and this is similar to the murjia who had the same belief that he said, it's enough that I just have iman and that actions are not part of iman. Just that I believe Allah and the Prophet ﷺ, this is it. And so my iman is the same as the iman of Jibra'il in that. And so we have the same kind of distortion amongst the Muslims as well in relation to this, this aspect. Now, because they say that he died upon the cross, then if you accept him as your salvation, then you will be saved. Now again, this is the beauty of Tawheed, brothers. This is the ni'mah of Tawheed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. Because Tawheed is part of our fitra, natural inclination. Now, if you happen to live in a place where there's no messenger that came to that place and that you never heard of Muhammad وسلم, or ever received a copy of the Quran, but you have Tawheed because you live upon your fitra, you are a believer. According to the Christians, you are not. You have to accept Isa alayhi salam. But how will you ever have heard of Isa alayhi salam if that message never came to you? That's why Christians believe in this concept of being missionaries, going to the four corners of the earth. Because they said, we have to go and tell everyone about the gospel. When I was in Uganda uh, uh, is it last year, when I was in, going back this year as well, when I was in Uganda, there were all these American missionaries that were there. And they were going, and bro, you know, brothers, I have to tell you this because I saw their zeal and their enthusiasm, paid their own money every month, a couple of years. They leave their jobs, they come back, they're from Texas. And they were so, even the local people said, we hate these people. I said, you know, I said, we, and, and they said, we love the Muslims. The Muslims actually build hospitals and they do things and they give zakat. They just come, they teach us the gospels and then they go away. They don't do anything for us as well. Because that's all they believe. Just to spread the message of the gospel, they've heard of Jesus. And if they don't accept him, they're damned forever. That's the belief that they hold. But look, the beauty of Tawheed is this, that if someone lives upon fitra and they affirm this belief, even like the, the Hunafa, like the people before the time that the message came down, they are believers. So this is why Islam is again unique. Islam is universally attainable by anyone. Anyone who has that belief, regardless of whether they heard the Quran or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they have Tawheed, they have this a part of the fitrah, then they are people who are saved. A few more points, inshallah. So Allah says, and remember when Allah said, O Isa, I will, t I will, I will take you and raise you up to myself and clear you uh, of those who disbelieve and I will make those who follow you superior to those who disbelieve uh, or in his books. Uh, so Allah Ta'ala, he talks about how he raised up, uh, and this is in uh, Surah Ali Imran, number 55. And so when the Jewish rabbis had conspired with Pontius Pilate, when they had conspired to send people to arrest the, uh, Isa alayhi salam and then crucify him, when Allah Ta'ala, he made this known to Isa alayhi salam and he's in a house with his companions. And so he says to his companions, which one of you will take my likeness and will take, uh, be crucified in my place? So he says this to the group. And the youngest one amongst them, he stands forward and says, I will do it. Isa alayhi salam says, no, you are too young. And he asked the question again, which one of you will take my likeness and will be crucified in my place? Again, that same shabab, young person, stands forward and says as well. Again, he asked, and then the third time he again stood. And so Allah Ta'ala put the likeness of Isa alayhi salam upon him. And then he was crucified instead of uh, Isa alayhi salam. And then Allah Ta'ala caused the roof of that house to open and then he was raised up and he resides not in Jannah but in the heavens, in the Sama'a, okay, where Allah Ta'ala has put it and then he will descend as I've mentioned. But the beauty of that story is, look brothers, you know, subhanAllah, look at the beauty when the Shabab are upon the Haq. And you see, look throughout the religion, I always say this, but the youth are the most important thing that we have, even in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu how he encouraged the Shabab, how they were there side by side with the elders. Ashabul Ukhdud, again, it's the story of the boy, the magician and the king. 
The boy who converted his whole nation to Tawheed through his actions. And look again, this Shabab, okay, who said, I will be the one who will take on you. No fear. Because that purity of fitrah is there and the guidance of Tawheed is there. That he says, I'll be the one who will take this. And he, some say that he was Simon of Cyrene. Others say he was Judas Iscariot. Uh, and there's a place actually in Palestine. Okay, the people of that called al Quriuti or the followers of Iscariot. So they, we don't know who he was in particular, but we know that this is the description that is related to us. So he was not therefore cru crucified. Uh, Again, as I mentioned uh, quite a few, just, just finish with it as well, brothers. As I mentioned about the, uh, the stories of... Uh, Okay, you know, uh, the descent of Isa alayhi salam. Again, this, this very important thing. Again, when Isa alayhi salam, when he does descent, just the important things uh, that, uh, as, I, as I said, he has been raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he will descend at a time of great hardship and difficulties for the Muslims as well. Uh, he will be the one, uh, Allah, Allah ta'ala has given him uh, glad tidings of obviously okay, delivering the Muslims in this time of great difficulty as well. As I said, when he, re when he comes back, Okay, he will lead the armies of the Muslims okay, against Dajjal and his armies. As we know, the fitna of Dajjal is a big talk in itself, but we know the fitna of Dajjal. How Dajjal's actions okay, will be such that they will deceive most of humanity. And most of his followers, as we know, they will be the Yahud as well. So the Yahud really, you know, in terms of the Yahud are still waiting for the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah. And as, in, as we know, that Messiah was the Prophet ﷺ, but because of their arrogance and their hasad, they refused to accept it. So they're still waiting for this Messiah. Isa alayhi salam comes and they will still reject Isa alayhi salam when he comes. And so the Messiah that they will follow, as we know, will be Dajjal. And as we know, one of the things that we are told by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he's given us this guidance so we protect ourselves. One of the things that Isa, uh, Dajjal when he comes, the Antichrist, when he comes, he will present to the people two rivers, one of fire and the one which is of cool water. And the believers, okay, if they choose the one of fire, this will be made cool for them. But if they choose the one which of cool water, this will be the fire for them as well. This is the deception. And this will be in terms of great fitna and turmoil, where Allah will confer miraculous events upon the Dajjal. To re and this, this is why this will be a great test upon these people. And it is in this time that as we know, Isa alayhi salam, he will come back and he will then kill the Dajjal. He will pursue the Dajjal to Al-Lud, which is in really, some people say it's a gate in Tel Aviv, in modern day Israel. Uh, Isa, uh, Okay, okay. Isa will catch with him at the eastern gate of Ulu and kill him and then the, the, the Jews will be uh, defeated. And really this is an event, as we know, that will come uh, towards the end of time. In particular, what I want to do relate, it will be that after this period of defeating the Jal, there will be a period of prosperity, which will be the time where he will be the Imam of the leader of humanity and he will establish justice for 40 years. And so this is what it said, it's a very uh, important thing. And in particular, what I encourage the brothers is that next time a Jehovah's Witness comes to you, just one moment, Ishaq. next time a Jehovah's Witness comes to you, I, I advise you to read this to them. Because Jehovah's Witnesses, and you'll see their eyes will change. Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that what will happen to the earth, and in many ways it shows the tahrif, they've also made this kind of false ta'wil as well of their religion. That they believe that uh, the earth will be transformed into a harmonious place and that their followers will have the dominion of this ha harmonious place. Uh, and Allah will establish therefore paradise on earth. This is what, but look what Allah Ta'ala says. It will indeed be 40, uh, this is the hadith that he's trying. It will be 40 years of exceptional life on earth as portrayed in the hadith. Peace will prevail and people will use their swords as sickles. Every harmful beast will be made harmless. The sky will send down rain in abundance and the earth will bring it forth blessings. Hatred will disappear. Every harmful animal will be made harmless so that infant will put, so the infant will put his hand into the snake's mouth without being harmed and the little girl will be able to make the lion run Run away from her. The wolf will go amongst the sheep as if a sheepdog. The earth will be filled with peace as a container is filled with water. People will be in complete agreement and only Allah will be worshipped. Wars, wars will cease and the authority of the of Quraysh will be taken away. The earth will be like a silver basin and it will produce fruit so abundantly that a group of people will gather to eat a bunch of grapes or pomegranate and will be satisfied. A bull will be worth so much money but a horse will have no value, i.e. a horse for war. People's activities will concentrate on plowing the land and bringing forth crops and they will abandon fighting to the point that the horse which is used in wars will be much cheaper than the bull to plow the land. For 40 years, humanity will experience such prosperity and peace as never. Then Isa alayhi salam will die and mankind will again plunge into ignorance and, uh, and kufr and then this will be the people upon which Yawm al-Qiyamah will come. 
So this is how, how the, uh, Allah Ta'ala, uh, the Prophet also related about the prosperity in these 40 years of Isa alayhi salam. In many ways, this is what Jehovah's Witnesses, they talk about this, but obviously they have had the false kind of understanding of this as well. Isa alayhi salam will then return back to this earth. And because all of the people Allah Ta'ala have to live and have to die, will live out the rest of his die and then will die his blessed death as well. And then as uh, you know, the, the hadith mentions, Okay, then this will be the worst group of people. Allah will then, as we know, the signs of Yom al Qiyamah, raising up the Quran, raising up the religion. All that will be left with the BP of people, all they will have remaining is that they will say, La ilaha illallah. And when asked why they say, La ilaha illallah, they said, We heard our forefathers saying this. And that will be the people upon which uh, the day of judgment will come. So, brothers, alhamdulillah, there's, uh, I know there's a lot of information for you today about different aspects of Isa alayhi salam in, in relation to this. I hope, inshallah, that's been of benefit for you. Jazakallah khair. Oh,